Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It is, um, this is the, actually the last chapter we're going to be speaking out of, Revelation chapter 22. And uh, we're going to begin in verse 1 in just a moment. And I'm going to share with you something that, uh, that I see in my spirit that I feel like the Lord has shown, you, shown me and uh, revealed to me actually yesterday morning. Uh, I'm trying to find my notes here, so just bear with me. What would the preacher do without his notes? You know what I'm saying? Amen. Yesterday I had so much on my mind. Uh, I was so concerned about the young people. Uh, we're in the process of building a home for ourselves. And uh, I've just been extremely busy. I've worked all of my life, seven days a week, doing something. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm a very multitask person. I can do more than one thing at one time. Amen. By the grace of God. Amen. The older I get, I begin to wonder because I walked to the refrigerator the other day and I thought, well, I'm going to have something to eat. And I had it on my mind. I looked at the refrigerator and I forgot what I was looking for. I thought, this could get serious. In Jesus' name, I need some help here, Lord. What was it I was looking for? And... Uh, but then the Lord revealed it to me. So uh, they say that comes with age. I don't know anything about that. My stomach was hollering. That's all I know. Praise the Lord. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. I want to spend just a few minutes talking to you about the will of God, something I see in the scriptures that I think will uh, is a revelation of the Lord. Uh, it's something that um, uh, may cause you to think a little bit differently about the will of God, perhaps, than you had thought before in times past. I'm going to read this, a little bit of scripture this morning, so just bear with me. Normally, I don't read this much scripture, but I feel it's necessary for me to do so today. And he showed me a pure river. If you turn me down just a little bit, gentlemen, I'm, I'm just a little bit too loud, I think. I'm kind of um, messing my own brain up here this morning. So that sounds better. Does that sound better out there? Amen. Amen. Lots better? Okay. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as a crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which have twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, <laughs> Woo. but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, and there is no need of a candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light that they shall reign forever and forever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show me his servants the things which must shortly, shortly come to pass. Behold, Jesus is speaking, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy and of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard them and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, for every man according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha, the Omega, 
the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Remember that. I am not the root of the offspring. I am the root of the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. Last verse for our text this morning. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And let him... Uh, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Father, thank you for the word of God, and thank you for what it means to us as your people. Thank you, Father God, that it is forever settled in heaven. We thank you, Lord, that as we apply the holy word of God to our lives, it brings us into the transformation of who you are. We love and praise you, Lord. Be with my lips today be with this vessel of clay that I may deliver something that I might not think but you have thought and you have said and it may come through these lips of clay to be a blessing to this precious people I pray in Jesus name amen this morning as I talk about the will of God I've got to first say to you that the will of God is something that we walk in on a daily basis uh, it's something that needs to be searched for and needs to be looked for and to understand that God's will is necessary for our lives in a great big way because God's will is his word. And God's will, the scripture teaches us that he that doeth or they that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. The word abide in the Bible means remain attached to. To abide means to be attached to. So what the scripture is saying is that those that look for the will of God and desire the will of God for their life, they remain attached to God. They remain attached to the will and purpose and plan of God. That frame of mind will get you blessed. It will get you blessed. Because God likes an honest heart. God likes integrity. God likes people coming clean before him. Amen? Amen? There's no greater prayer than you can pray than the prayer of faith which says, God help me, I'm a sinner. I'm lost, I need your help. Teach me your ways. God understands that language. So we understand this morning that number one, the will of God, according to Ephesians 5 and 18, God's will is that you be filled with the Spirit. The scripture says that you be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit of God. Then we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through and 14, 3 and 4, God's will is that you be sanctified. It is the will of God that you be separate from the world. It is the will of God that God's people look different, act different, talk different, and live different than the world. Amen. We are no longer of the world. Amen. It's time to put off the old man and put on the new man in Christ Jesus. Amen. It alarms me a lot when I see people call on the Lord for salvation and their lives do not change. That alarms me whether or not they've had a true encounter with the true and the living God. Amen. It concerns me because the things you used to do that you knew you shouldn't do, you don't want to do them anymore when you meet Jesus. Yep. Come on now, some of you old timers help me here this morning. Some of you old saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost people help me here this morning, will you? Amen. The scripture plainly tells us it is the will of God that we be set apart and that we know how to present ourselves to the Lord in separation from the world. We live in the world, but we are not of this world. 
anymore. We're pilgrims passing through. If you're standing next to someone somewhere and uh, one of them's cussing and you're cussing, listen, you're not separated yet. One of the first things the Lord did for me when he came into my life was clean up my potty mouth. And I had one. In fact, I think I had two potties. Yeah, I made up for other people. You know, I was a mean dude. Could you imagine me being mean? Can you imagine it? But I was a rascal. This guy on the front row here knows that years ago. Amen, in a 68 Roadrunner. But we won't talk about that, amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we understand it is God's will for us to be sanctified. It's also God's will for us to be saved. First, uh, Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, the Bible says that it's God's will that all men would come unto repentance and to the knowledge of the truth. But I wanna tell you something this morning, that is God's will, but the fact is not everyone will be saved. That's a fact. There's those that will reject the salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's also God's will that you prosper. Uh, Third John chapter one, verse one, it's God's will that you prosper. Number two, it's God's will that you be in good health even as number three, your soul prospers. So there's a process there in John, third John one and one, is that uh, the tripartite blessing from the Lord is that you, your soul will prosper. In other words, that you would start thinking like a child of God. Your intellect and your will and your emotions will become subject to the will and purpose of God and you'll start thinking about what does please God? It alarms me when I see people say I'm a Christian and that daily there's no application to God fix my mind. Fix my mind. Because when I was in the drug world, when I woke up in the morning, I was looking for something else to smoke or take or whatever. But when I became a Christian, it was like, Whoa, no more of that stuff, man, because that stuff messed me up. And I'm out of that world, and I'm into this thing called living for Jesus now. Amen. And so what's on my mind now when I first get up is Jesus. Amen. So you start thinking differently. It's God's will, uh, number seven, that you have a sound mind. Yes. That your mind be sound. That you're not like a twig blown in the wind, and you're not like a... Uh, a cattail blown in the wind, but you have your, you're not a double-minded person. You're a person that says, I know in whom I believe, and I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him. No one else can make that commitment for you. You must make that commitment yourself. Amen? Amen. Amen. So these things are the will of God, that you prosper, be in good health, you have a sound mind. The scripture says in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, for God has not given you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and of a sound mind. So we've read in the scriptures here in Revelation chapter 22 that how does the will of God relate to the river of God? How does the will of God relate to the water of life that Jesus offers so freely? And something I want to share with you because here's what the scripture says of your first encounter <clears throat> with being born again. In 2 Peter, the Bible says that when you were born again, you were born of the seed of God. And then the scripture says in, in 2 Peter, uh, and I want you to turn there and look into that verse with me. This morning, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And I want you to see this, what has happened to you when you were born again. I want to bring assurance to you as a child of God that you are who the Bible says that you are. You are a child of God. You may not feel like a child of God some days. Some days you may feel less than a child of God because you have not behaved yourself in the sight of God. But listen, by faith, you are a child of God. And because you are a child of God, look at this verse of Scripture. Whereby he has given unto us exceeding, somebody say exceeding, exceeding. great, precious promises, 
that by these you might be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So what happened to you and me when we were born again, we became partakers of the divine nature of God. I want that to sink inside of you because now you are not your own, but you are, have been and will be and continue to be as a child of God dwelling in the nature of Christ. So the thing that we're looking for is the nature of Christ. I want to know who he is. I don't want to know just about God. I want to know who God is for myself. So you're a partaker, I'm a partaker of the nature of God. I have seen Jesus. What was one of the first things that the early church had in common? The Bible says that when God's people in the first century church walked by unsaved people and people that were unregenerated and people that did not know God, the Bible says the observance from the people that were observing the Christians was I can tell those men have been with Jesus. They had not been with Jesus because they were talking like him, looking like him, and they wouldn't, uh, it, it wasn't distinguished that, that they had been with Jesus because they just kind of walked a certain way. They knew that they had been with Jesus because the nature of Jesus was coming out of those disciples. Love and compassion. Mercy and grace and power. Authority. Faith to believe God. Faith to walk with God. Faith to lift their heads, your heads above the problems and difficulties and say, my God shall supply. I know that he will. You can only say those kind of things because you know him. Not about him, but you know him. You know his reputation. We read in the scriptures here that God's uh, hand will be upon our lives when we've been introduced to him uh, in the book of Revelation where it says, and they shall see his face. They shall see his face. When shall they see his face? When they meet him. Now, I'm going to say something this morning that's probably going to shock you and alarm you. But I say a lot of stuff like that, don't I? Okay, but it's going to probably shock you. It is not the love of Christ that reveals who Christ is. Come on. You know what it is? The Bible says that it is the goodness of God that leads men to salvation. Now let me say this this morning, that involves the love of God. You've got to know it. It's, it's got love written all over it. And it's not man love, it's agape love. It's God love to man, extended to man. You understand? But it's not because everybody is just loving everybody. Because some people's definition of loving another is based solely upon the fact that they're loving because they want something in return. Yes. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. So, but God's love is unconditional. It's extended, but it's extended with the face of Jesus in mind. In other words, when you see Jesus, you're revealed to who he is and you are, have been revealed to the very nature of who he is. The Bible says he's a good God. You had better know it. He's a good God. The Bible says he is a provider. You had better know he is your provision. The Bible says he is a God of authority. You had better know he's got the power. Amen? And it's, it, it, he's the real thing, man. You have got to know, he says he gives you his peace. You had got to know he is peace. He says he's given you his love. He is love. He don't just have love. It's his nature. It's who he is. And listen, listen, even in relationships with other people, you've got to learn, we've got to learn how to trust people. And there's some people you can't trust. I've tried to trust some people and it's like, my God, man, they don't have no idea what that means. 
But if you can trust another person and learn how to trust, listen, husband and wife, you need to learn how to trust one another. When I first met uh, Chrissy uh, back there, she's not in here, so I can talk now. I was insanely jealous. I'd pick the biggest guy out that she was talking to. She had no intentions of dating him. Don't let, oh, she is in here. Oh, my God. <clears throat> oh, hallelujah. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. But anyway, I was insanely jealous because why? I didn't trust her. I didn't know her enough to trust her. 14, 15, 16 years old. I didn't know how to trust. But over the years, after we had been married three or four years, I learned that I could trust her. I could trust her. And now she talks to a, a gentleman. I watch real close, but I trust her. <laughs> hey, mama didn't raise no dummy. <clears throat> so just remember that. Moving right along. It had nothing to do with my sermon, but I thought I'd put it out there. Amen? Husbands and wives need to know how to trust one another. Amen? Because they love one another. They're bound by the, good, the goodness that they see in one another. Uh, churches need to trust their pastor. The pastor needs to trust the people in the pew and give them opportunity, the benefit of the doubt, and uh, let people do things and, and so on and so forth. But I want you to know and understand that, that we can trust God. Because he is who he says he is. So here's what he says. Excuse me. We are given unto us exceeding the great and precious promises. Now I looked up the word promise and I want, you, I want to declare it to you what it means here because I want to get to the meat of my subject. I haven't been preaching yet. I'm, I'm trying to get there. Okay, I'm doing my best. But this word promise, we've been left precious promises. He didn't say I'll give you a promise if you're a good boy. Yeah, people have the idea that if they're, if they're not doing good one day, then they're not the son of God or the daughter of God. But listen, you don't come in and out of being a blood-bought blood daughter or son of God. Hallelujah. I know the Lord's putting up with stuff with you guys. I know. Just think of how much he puts up with me. That'll make you feel better. Huh? You understand? You understand? But the Lord has made promises. And listen, when God makes a promise, there's one thing that God cannot do. Do you know what that is? He cannot lie. So when he makes a promise, he fully intends to bring it into absolute, complete fruition for your life. You may not know that yet, but he is a God that keeps his word. When I was growing up as, as a child, my daddy taught me how to shake a hand, and he said, son, there's one thing I'm going to tell you, and I'll never forget my daddy doing this. He was a tough little dude, man. He, was, he liked me. He grabbed my hand, and he said, son, when you tell a man you're going to do something, you do it, and you pay your bills before you eat, and you'll get along in life real good. Amen. That's one thing my daddy told me, and I'll never forget him saying that. He grabbed my hand. Come here, you Marine. I got, you ain't nothing. Sit down, boy. He shook my hand like that right there. You do have a pretty good grip. You're hurting me, man. He's got a pretty good grip. But he shook my hand just like I did Brandon's right there. It was pretty firm, wasn't it? And he said, you do that. And I want to tell you something. That's the way it is with God. When you gave your life to Christ, you entered into covenant with God and he shook your hand. And listen, his covenant is an everlasting covenant. Amen. Never ends. So the word promise means, and here's what it means as far as God is concerned, a declaration that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will absolutely happen. God says he made promises to you that a particular thing is going to happen and then particular things are going to happen absolutely. Yes. Listen, as far as God is concerned, he knows your beginning. And listen, friend, he knew you before you were even born. And listen, he even knew before you were thought of to be in your mama's womb, he knew you. He knew you are going to come about. 
So don't be complaining your, who your daddy and your mama was. Your daddy and your mama was your daddy and your mama that God allowed you to be. And be thankful that you're here today to enter into the promises of God and the blessings of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you can be assured this morning that the promises of God directed to your life have been made by God and will be fulfilled by God. As you see Jesus. So the goodness of God is drawing us. The goodness of God is uh, uh, making provision for us because hear the word in verse 1 of chapter 22 of Revelation. It says, And he showed me a pure river, water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding. And that word proceeding attracted my attention when I read it the other day. I've read this hundreds of times. But yesterday morning or yesterday afternoon, I forget. What, what was yesterday? That was Saturday, right? Okay. I'm alive. I'm okay. I'm okay. That word just leaped off the page, proceeding. Because the scripture says that every man shall live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4, 4, Luke 4, 4. You understand that he says it here in the last book of the Bible. How many of you know that when somebody says something in their last words, in their last thoughts, you'd better pay attention to it? Because it means what the person's been saying for 6,000 years. You understand? So he says, there was a pure river proceeding, and this word proceeding is a powerful word that we can look at this morning because it, it, it just sums up a lot of things, and the word proceeding uh, means to make available for a constant supply. To make available. So God made this available to the people of God that there's a constant supply, a constant flowing. When God promised Israel something, what did he promise them at first? He said, I will give you a land that flows with milk and honey. And you will not have to build those houses. I will give you houses that you don't even have to build. I will give you lands and I will give you fruit. The, the scripture says there was pomegranates, in other words, grapes that big around, as big as grapefruits in that land. He said it is a land that flows. Jesus, when he came on the scene, he said every man that hungers and thirsts, let him come after me and drink and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You've got to understand when you go to the book of Genesis even, the Bible says, there was darkness upon the face of the deep and that when the, the Spirit of God was moving on the face of the deep. Amen. You've got to understand there's something about a river. There's something about a river that God mentions it over and over and over in the Bible that there is a river. There is a river and it's teeming with life. And when you look up the word teeming with life, according to Ezekiel, you find that the word teeming, uh, it means something that just kind of intrigued me. It means fur full of fertility to become pregnant. I want to ask you this morning, how many of you, uh, no, not literally, only women can get pregnant. I know Brittany back there is pregnant and she's really pregnant. I understand that. But I'm talking about getting fertile and full of fertility with the things of God. The possibility that my life means something. The possibility that I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. The possibility that God's put a design on my life and he's put a name written down in my forehead and his hand is upon my life. Hallelujah. I'm talking about getting pregnant with the things of God. Getting pregnant, my God. Amen. And then hanging on to that. Nobody I know that wants to get rid of a child. And if, you know, as a man, if I could get pregnant, I, well, forget it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't even, just skip that. Put, take that off. Amen. Do something with it. Hallelujah. But it means to get fertile and to become pregnant so the Bible says if God puts his seed and he did he put his seed in you 
He said, now you cannot sin. And if you do sin, you will not like the sin like you used to like it. Aren't you glad that you can't run? You can't hide? You think you'd be sneaking off somewhere and do something, you can forget it. You won't have any fun anymore because you already got the seed of God in you. You think him babies are going to keep running from God? You just remind yourself and you remind the devil the seed of God is upon your children and the power of God is on. There's a hook in their jaw. They can't go anywhere and have fun anymore. They ain't nobody, nobody's here this morning, Jesus. They all left the building. So we find that God is a God of promise and he is also a God of provision. And he is a God that provides. He's a God of promise, a God of provision, a God that provides. Where does that come from? I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from the nature of who he is that you have discovered. Hey. He tells you he loves you with an unconditional love. You had better know. He loves you with an unconditional love. He tells you he will be with you even to the end of the age. You had better know he's not left you. And you better thank God because when you got out there and drove that car and you had an accident and the, the devil tried to take you out and an angel of the Lord went, I know that I, I've had some accidents that should have happened and they didn't happen. I turned back and I said, where'd that car go? Because it had to go through my car. Hey, you're not done yet. You're not done. You got them angels guarding you. Now, I want to read something to you because Marco said something this morning just to bless me. Something's happening. Something's taking place. Something's occurring. There's a stirring. There's an encouragement. There's an excitement. There's an exhilaration. There's something that's taking place. And listen, I want to tell you this. It's not because that a, a man or some person is, is real charismatic or real influential and all that kind of stuff. I detest that kind of stuff. Listen, that, that'll get you the snare of man. But I'm talking about the Spirit of God moving in and among through people. The Spirit of God. Spirit of God waking you up in the morning and you're saying, oh Jesus, who can I pray for today? Spirit of God giving you a desire to help other people. The Spirit of God giving you a desire to say, my God, I've got to do something to help somebody else today or I, I just won't be able to make it. I've got to do something to serve. The Bible says that the name of God is going to be on the foreheads of those that serve. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. Those that serve. We just read it this morning. It's the servant's heart. Somebody said, I'm going I'm I'm to do something for Jesus. Well, pick that piece of paper up right there. Somebody pick that up right there because it's like serve, man. We do all things as unto the Lord. Everything that we do, we do it cheerfully from a cheerful heart. We do it because it's, just, it's a privilege to do it. I'm learning at home that, that you know, where we're, we're, we're living right now and the, and the floor's getting dirty because we're tracking mud and stuff in. And last night I had this idea. I thought, well, now I'll get the vacuum cleaner out myself. I hope I don't break it. Because then I'll really be in trouble. So I get the vacuum cleaner out and I vacuum the floor. And I thought, Lord, this is fun, man. She's got one of them Cadillac kind, man, just kind of glide across the floor by itself. I'm going, woo, woo. Turns, it turns on a dime. It just, whoo, man, it's like cutting grass, man. I'm enjoying this. I'm getting a good sermon right here. Serving, 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 because it's in your nature to do it. And listen, what did Jesus do when he went to a cross? My God, what did he do, man? I'm telling you, the Bible says he took on the form of a servant, became obedient even to death, even the death of the cross. I mean, he served unto death. My God, he served. That's a servant's heart. It's a servant's heart. I, get so, I got so tickled yesterday when I went down to Rule King 
and I saw, saw the youth pastors and I saw all the people down there. I got so excited. I said, my God, give me two hamburgers right now. <laughs> I'll buy the whole box. If I could, give me the whole crate. It was so exciting just to be around the people of God and watching the love of God flow. David Fink back there flipping them hamburgers. Man, he does a good job. I'm going to hire him next time. I need some more help. Mark saying that's a good one. Amen. God is good, man. But there is a river of life. And it's teeming with life. It's full of fertility. It's full of the absolute possibility of fertility for your life. Listen, I'm not going to think about who's done me wrong and who's talking about me. Listen, there's plenty of people here in Evansville, Indiana, and you preachers know who you are. But I, you just keep your words to yourself, and if you want to get them out there, they're going to come back and bite you. That's all I'll say in defense right there. You see, the devil wants you to come back and defend yourself so that people won't say things and do things to you. Listen, it's not about me. I don't have a life anyway. It doesn't matter what people say. All that matters is, is that the power of God touches people's lives and ministers to people. And lives are changed by the power of God. When are we going to stop playing games in the church and start preaching the gospel that changes people's lives? Not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it. I'm ready for it. Amen. Now let me get to the meat of this in closing Ezekiel chapter uh, 47. I want to show you how the will of God is directly connected to the river of God and to the tree of life. Because the scripture says in Revelation that there was a, a uh, river, and but there was also a tree. Uh, the trees were for the healing of the nations. And I know this is prophetic. And I know this is relating to the millennial reign, the thousand year millennial reign. But everything that is prophetic is also available in spirit to the child of God today. Amen. Understand that. Don't ever think that you've got to wait to the millennial reign to be healed. Don't think you've got to wait to the millennial reign to experience the very presence of God. That's what this church is all about, guardians of the glory of God. That's what we're about. We want to see Jesus and also experience him, who he really is. That'll make you a target to the lost world and to the religious world. It'll make you a target. There goes one, another one of those Holy Ghost filled language talking Where'd you get that language? I got it from Jesus, so that's all there is to say. How, what happened? Yeah, I got it from Jesus. I speak about six different languages and never went to school for it. He gave it. So you understand that in Ezekiel, as we look at it together here, it's, it's very powerful because uh, it says volumes to us in Ezekiel. Have you got it up there on the screen? Did I give you that chapter? There, Ezekiel chapter 47. This is prophetic too, and it goes right along with what we're talking about, and I'm about finished. But I want you to see this. In verse 1, he says, And afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house. Somebody say the house. And he brought me to the door of the house, and behold, waters. There's something about the water of life. It also represents the Holy Ghost. Represents the Holy Spirit. Water represents the Holy Spirit. A flowing water represents the movement of the Spirit of God. And how many know the church world needs the movement of the Spirit? I don't want to go to a, a, a place where it's sterile. I don't want to go to a place where it's a form of God, no power. I want to be somewhere where the Spirit of God is moving. Amen? Amen? <clears throat> the waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward for the format of the house stood toward the east and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house at the south side the altar <clears throat> then brought me in and out of the way of the gate of the northward and led me about the way without <clears throat> until the outer gate by the way that looketh eastward and behold there ran waters at the right side and when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubics, and that's 20 foot per cubic, if my memory serves me correctly, 
a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. So it started at the threshold. And this is what is saying today is that God gives an opportunity to every man at the threshold. At the very beginning of their life, he gives them an opportunity to find the water of life. No man is going to be with an excuse saying, I didn't have an opportunity. It does not matter where you grew up, who you were, and what you were told. The Spirit and the bride say, come, and the Holy Ghost is moving on people's lives now, right now, and drawing them to salvation. He's moving. Jesus said, I come quickly. I come quickly. And so what he's saying here this morning is this, that the water level can rise, the power of God can rise in your life and in my life if I wade out a little deeper and invite the water to flow. I can't swim in threshold water. I can get introduced to water. I can get introduced to what brings life. But I can't swim in it. I can't even swim in ankle deep water. But I can get a feel of what it's like. Here's what I'm saying. If you could yield, those of you watching online, if you could yield something that you know you shouldn't be doing and you give it up for Christ and just give it away for Christ, you're going to be getting into the ankle deep stuff and you're going to be getting into something that you could feel and you know it's real. And when you let it go, it's going to get up to your knees and you're going to know that God has done something in your life. But you're going to have to be willing to give some stuff up. Somebody said, well, I just can't. I can't do that. I, 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 I won't do that. But if you will do that, you want to experience God? Give some stuff up and then go to Jesus. Do I have to give up some stuff to go to heaven? It's very possible you're going to have to give some stuff up to go to heaven because it's going to be in your way. And God, the Bible says, he that is a fornicator, let them be a fornicator. That means that the person that's having sex before marriage is going to be in trouble. No fornicator entered the heaven. The scripture says that sorcery, listen to me. Those of you watching online right now, I want you to hear this. And those in this room to hear this. Listen, those of you that are practicing witchcraft, which is control. You want the center of attention and you want to control other people's lives by you being the center of attention. And you want to speak mantras and all of this kind of thing. Your work is deceased and it is dead by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can do nothing to the child of God. You can do nothing to the church of the living God. You can do nothing to the power of the Holy Ghost. You are defeated, you witchcraft spirit. You're defeated. Not because of me, it has nothing to do with me, but by the power of God. If you're gonna see something happen in your life, you're gonna have to see it only because he did it. Hey, this modern day lifting men up and making men look like some kind of modern day's uh, uh, diamond king and all that mess, that stuff's got to stop, man. It's got to quit. There's nothing about you or me that means anything. But what matters is there is a God that lives inside of you that matters. When you pray, don't be looking like you're somebody in some kind of divine healer and you're out there and you're a divine healer. You ain't nothing. But the God in you can heal. The God in you can get people to Jesus, yes. But you, sir, are poor, pitiful clay, a mud ball. That's where you come from. Don't forget it. I'm not talking about not speaking up for the kingdom of God because you've got a mouth and what you say will come to pass and I understand that. I understand that we need to watch what we say because you'll get it. You've got authority with God but when it comes down to it, we've got to say, God, you can do this and if you do this through me, I'll be thankful that somebody else can get help because your word will never come back void. It's time to elevate Jesus in the church world today. Come on.
Somebody praise him. Don't patty cake. I'm going to finish. Here's what he said in verse 4. He said, he measured the thousand and it came up to the knees. And again, he measured the thousand and brought through the waters worth to the loins. In other words, up to the, to the waistline. That's loins, isn't it? Up to the, come on, some of you smart people, help me. I only had nine years of college. Help me. Help me. Okay, to the loins. And he said to me, son of man, hast thou seen this? Here's the question right here. I'm almost finished, but here's the question. Have you seen it? That's what he asked the man of God. He asked Ezekiel. He said, have you seen this? And that's opportunity. That's you and I's opportunity to say, God, you see, when I was lost without God and when you were lost without God, God dealt with you, but you didn't see who he was until you invited him in. You couldn't see it. You couldn't see it. You knew there was a God, your mama, your daddy, you were raised in church, raised in, in school that taught Christianity, whatever the case might be. But you didn't know until you actually said, Jesus changed my life, and then you seen. Now I see who he is. I didn't know how good he was and how merciful he was. I didn't know that it was actually God keeping me from dying in the drug world. I didn't know that, didn't realize that, didn't understand that. I knew God had something to do with it. But the very minute I called on him and said, Jesus changed my life, I seen him, hallelujah, hallelujah. and experienced him. Such love that you, you and I, we know as God's people, you know it's a total transformation. I went out and smelled the grass for the first time in my life. And not marijuana. <laughs> Smelt fresh cut grass, March 15. And went outside the church and went, my oh God, somebody's cutting grass. And it's like freedom. Freedom, man. Freedom to know that it is, my mama said it, my great grandma said, it's a good life living for Jesus. It's a good life. It is a good life. You understand that out of the church, I've got to get ahead here. Out of the church will flow this river. Listen, you cannot do this independently. You can't do this because, uh, you know, you, you feel like you've been given some kind of privilege that other people don't have. Let me tell you something. You had better get rid of those devilish spirits that are lingering on your life and you feel like you're something. The sons of Sceva did that in the Bible and you cannot buy the things of God. They're freely given by Jesus Christ. Amen. Can't buy them. I had a man one time, he said, I put a lot of money in your church preacher. He said, he said you ought to recognize that. And I said, man, I thank God that you put some money in the church. And he said, I want to pay my tithes. It's $1,000 today. But listen, I'm telling you, you got to do some changing. I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to change right now. You're going to hit the door and I'm going to keep preaching like I'm preaching. Amen. You cannot sway this man with money. Amen. I don't need your money. God don't need your money. God just needs your heart. If you'll give him your heart and your life, you'll be all right. But don't you think you're going to sway me with money? We, we had 11, uh, 9 or 10, 11 people with no money, and we built this facility that cost over a half a million dollars and started building it with no money. Amen. Guess who had it? Amen. This facility right now is worth well over a million dollars, and we only owe a fraction of that today. <clears throat> God is my supplier. Amen. Amen. Amen? Understand that this water to swim in and this tree of life. The Bible says, David, David said this. He said, you'll be like a tree that's planted by the waters that shall not be moved. There's something about trees and rivers in the Bible. Everything, the river flows, the river, and everything the river touches flows with the river. And every, listen to this. Look at this right here. <clears throat> Look at this right here. I love this. And he said to me, son of man, verse six, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I return, behold, and the bank of the river, the very many trees on either side of it, then said he unto me, these waters issue toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which belong, bringeth forth into the sea. The waters shall be healed. You see that? 
This is prophetic, but the water shall be healed and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth. I've got to say this. Everything that liveth, look at this, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come shall live and there shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come thither for they shall be healed and everything that that lives, whether in the river, it cometh forth. I want to ask you something. Are you alive? Are you living? Well, you're going to continue to live because you're alive. The scripture guarantees you will come forth. The work God's designed for you, the will of God for your life is coming every day because the river's touching your life. You are living and the living will produce the coming forth of the fruition and the fruit of the living. Look at this. Look at this. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it in Ethian and Elon and they shall be a place spread for the nets and their fish shall be according to their kinds and the fish of the great and exceeding many but the miry places thereof in other words those that refuse the miry places the marshes shall not be healed shall not be healed you see everybody's not going to get this thing only those in the water and it would be turned to salt. And it says, And by the river of the bank thereof, on either side of the, of, of the river shall grow all trees that meet, whose leaves shall fade, neither shall fade. Shall the fruit thereof be consumed, and it shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters there issued out of the sanctuary. What am I telling you, folks? I'm telling you, if you're in the church, and you're all the way in the church, there's some power and authority is going to flow out of your life. You're going to be used in these last days like no other people are going to be used. We are the remnant church. We're the last day's church. And it's out of the sanctuary the water will flow. I want to tell you, I'm going to serve notice on the devil right now and I want to tell you, I want God's power and authority and spirit to flow from this house right here. I don't care what the world calls us Pentecostal nuts or whatever. I've never called myself a Pentecostal. I believe in Pentecost. I experience Pentecost. I'm a child of the Most High, and what this book says is what I'm going to receive. Amen. Period. And that's the bottom line. My daddy started out as a Catholic. My mama started out as a Pentecostal holiness. I was raised Southern Baptist. Where in the world you going? What, how are you going to get this thing right? And I became a Christian the very minute I gave my life to Jesus. I never looked at myself as a Catholic, a Baptist, a Pentecostal, or a holiness. I looked at myself as a follower of Jesus Christ, of the Son of the living God, period. <clears throat> That's the way it is. We got people from all backgrounds here at this church. If there's anything going to happen in your life, it's going to be because the Spirit of God's moving in your life. There's life where the Spirit of God is. There's a flow. You want to prosper? You say, here's what the Bible says. Even if you get gray-headed, you'll still prosper in your old age. That's what the scripture says. And I've been claiming that one because, man, I've got hair, but most of it is gray. And I'm saying, God says, what I got left, I want to prosper. <laughs> you promised. Hallelujah. And some of you got hair, I'm envious. Share it. <laughs> Implant something. Pray it on me, in me, or somewhere. Hallelujah. So he says here that the, out of the sanctuary and the fruit thereof shall be for the meat and the leaf for medicine. And you know the word medicine. I looked up the word medicine right there. And the word medicine means the worship and glorification of God. That's your medicine. Hey, you find an impossible situation you can't handle? Father, I thank you and I bless your holy name. There's your medicine. There's your medicine. God can take that right there and he can turn it around and you won't even know how he did it and he'll put it right in front of your face and say, here you go. It's powerful, man. And you shall inherit uh, the, the blessing and the will of God, verse 14, and another concerning that which I left into your hand, give it unto your fathers and your land shall, shall fall unto you for inheritance. And this 
shall be for the border of the land toward the north side and toward the great Hethlin River and Zedekiah. You understand that the will of God is because, first of all, the Lord has touched your life with His Spirit. The Scripture says you can't come to the Lord without the Spirit drawing. And the Scripture teaches us that we are to be filled with the Spirit. We can start out at, at ankle deep, but somewhere along the line, we have got to come to a place as a person and as a people. We need more in our life of God than what a lot of us are experiencing. Come on. Everybody in this room, everybody watching live, we need not what we used to have. And I thank God for what we used to have in the church. I thank God for it. The heritage that we have. But I personally am an inheritor of the things of God and I must go after God myself. And ask the Lord, to give me greater revelation of who He is. He is coming after a church that's watching and waiting. He's coming after a people that's anticipating His coming. Yes. Come on. Some of you saints, you remember what that was about when you first got saved? You, the preacher would say, He's coming, and you'd go, Whoa, glory to God, hallelujah. What are you saying now? Are you kind of like, uh, you know, uh, you can hold off a while, no. Are you still saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus? Yes. Would you stand with me this morning? And I want to give this, this small altar call because, you know, there's so much spiritual significance to everything in the Scripture. When the Lord promised to Israel He'd give them a land, He specifically stated that it would be a land that flows and he specifically stated that it would be a land that flows with milk and with honey. How do you know that honey represents healing? Milk represents nutrition. Do you understand that? That the Lord was prophetically saying, I'll give you a land that flows with nutrition. And I'll give you a land that flows with healing. That, that includes the mind, the spirit, the body. Healing's the children's bread. You know, God doesn't leave anything out. Nothing. And so what we're speaking to you this morning is, is that uh, and those of you that are in the room today and those of you watching on live streaming today, is that God has given us an invitation to go deeper with the things of God, but it's possible that there's some things that you need to put off of your life. You need to say, Jesus, I give them to you because here's what happens if you don't get those things. A lot of them are just weights, but some of them may be sins. But if you don't get those things off your life, they will beset your life. You follow me? They'll hold you back from what it is God has so freely given you. And it will cause confusion for your life. 